Hi guys, welcome back to the channel. So Jerome and I today are going to be talking about bodybuilding for the sedentary. Uh, we might also get into aspects of the carnivore diet and how that can actually expedite and improve your results when you're doing some kind of program. So um, welcome back, Jerome. How you doing? Doing great, Jonathan. Thanks for having me on today. How are you? Yeah, I'm good. Thank you. Uh, very good. It's nice of you to join me the early hours of your morning. So I appreciate, appreciate it. I don't. I never sleep anyway, so it's always a joy. Always a joy to chat. Oh yeah, excellent. So we're going to be discussing training for people that have issues with mobility. So they're very sedentary people that perhaps can't stand up, can't walk upstairs. People that are so mobile that they really need just some points, some advice of something to do. Because um, I, I do understand a lot of people in the carnivore community have issues getting around. You know, a lot of us are. Suffering with arthritis, perhaps, um, joint issues, loss of pain. I think this sort of valuable information would be um, very important for people to hear. So I'd probably like to discuss um, the outline of why carnivore dieting is really good for the body as like a starting point. Of course, people that are probably watching this already understand the benefits, but just to outline a few key points, um, it does seem to lower excessive chronic inflammation in the body so that means your joints aren't as stiff it means you can actually exercise more effectively um other things as well your digestive system is better so you could tolerate different foods you're gonna have less flare-ups in your joints and things like that um the other things as well obviously it all comes together to promote good restful sleep you know guys we can't recover if we're not sleeping well so that's just a few little pinpoints i can think of what about you jerome what can you think of in regards to the diet and um mobility and things like that yeah yeah i think um i think we drastically underappreciate the role that diet really has on somebody's well-being um eating a species appropriate diet not only drastically reduces inflammation like you said but it's um it greatly you know it's very nutrient dense and i think in a lot of ways it, it promotes kind of a systemic healing um we see that people that eat carnivore for a long period of time often have their hunger and satiety signals and their cravings change over a period of time. And it makes me think that there's probably a lot of other hormonally mediated functions that are also improving behind the scenes. Um, people experience a lot of mental clarity, um, more focus, sleeping better, falling asleep faster, reversing sleep apnea. Um, you're right. Sleep is, is critically important, especially for anybody who has any kind of physical ailments, um, so eating a species appropriate diet is just, it's going to put people in the best position possible to work with the conditions that they have and to be able to recover from them. Um, I've had a hypothesis for a long period of time that someone cannot optimally function if they're not eating an optimal diet. And granted, that's, you know, a bit of a spectrum, um, but I, I lean quite strongly in that direction. So people that are trying to improve the quality of their life with whatever conditions they may have, it's, it's absolutely imperative that they try and eat as close to a species appropriate carnivore diet as possible. Yeah. Very well said. Very well said. Um, other thing as well, people have stumbling, um, blocks along the way, you know, some people have deposits of oxalate in their joints in some cases might not be that they reduce all their symptoms and pain straight away. It might just take a bit more time. So yeah. what we're going to outline in this is basically getting people to build their body to some extent, keep muscle tissue on, um, prevent sarcopenia, prevent osteoporosis, do all these things with the carnival diet and add in some element of resistance training in some kind of way. Some kind of activity is um, very beneficial for most people. Um, one thing that I think is quite useful for people is... Um, even just going for walks, like having that weight, weight bearing load on your body, you know, as a whole body is going to be very valuable for people that are very inactive. Um, mm -hmm. I know, for example, if someone's walking, it might be maybe two times their body weight going for the skeleton at each step. Um, if you're going to run, it might be six to eight. If you're going to sprint, it might be like 10, 12, 13, 14 times more. So this sort of thing is very, very valuable. Um, something is effectively better than nothing. Yeah. So if someone could go for a walk, that might be a good place to start. Um, other things as well to think about are walking upstairs. If your stairs are too steep, you might just do a half a lunge across the hall. 
yeah, it's going to be very valuable as well. Um, so what I mean by that is you're not lunging knee to ground, you're just maybe just a half that range of motion. That's going to give you some kind of aerobic fitness in a way, a bit of strengthening, a bit of core stability, things like that. Um, mm. From there, the next step up might be to do the same, I don't know, holding a tin of beans in each hand. It might be that you're holding it in your hand um, like that or up above your head sort of thing. So something which is adding a level of stability training because some people out there really, really cannot walk straight. Yeah. And it's partly because they're not used to it. And, you know, as time goes on, they can build up that mobility, that strength. And I know it sounds a bit, a bit bizarre, you know, two carnival bodybuilders talking about doing these sort of things, but, you know, a lot of people out there are in this kind of state and they do need this device. Um, so where you might go from that is taking steps up the stairs. So if you have steps available around you or a little hill, you know, you can go on a slight incline. That's useful as well. As well. So um, there's, like I said, there's levels to it. Um, you can add a yep. rock at your back, you know, do one step at a time, do two steps at a time. Uh, if, you, if you want to do it safely, use a handrail. You know, it sounds yep. very basic and simple, but some people might think it's trivial or not useful for them, but I honestly think it is. Um, and it's like a, a, an example, my grandmother, she's nearly 92 years old. Um, she's had two hip replacements, has um, arthritis in her back in lots of different places. Um, she has scoliosis. She's still very fit, slim, doesn't overeat. You know, she follows the best diet she can at least follow um, with her culture, her upbringing, things like that. Yeah. Now saying that, she's not had excess weight on her body throughout her whole life. She's been able to maintain a good level of fitness and mobility because she's never been overweight. So whilst we say, yes, you can try all these training methodologies, you can also look at your diet to make sure you're not eating too much. So that's why a carnival diet is also very beneficial. It effectively stops you binge eating and going too too far overboard in terms of the weight that you hold in your body. Um, I mean, what other exercises can you think about, Jerome, for someone that is quite inactive? Yeah, and you're right in that it seems a little weird for two bodybuilders to be talking about people who are so far on the other side of the spectrum of the physical capacity and, and potential work output. Um, but these are really the people that need exercise and safe exercise the most. Um, so you and I and you know can take for granted certain activities of daily life, but some people really struggle just to walk. Um, so you know their lives are every bit as important as mine or anyone else's. So I, I tend to think, you know, what can somebody do? You know, if they're if they're bedridden and they're only capable of performing certain movements, um, what movements can you perform that either aren't painful or aren't painful for most of the majority of the range of movements? And then I, I think one of the best things that people can do that really struggle to perform a lot of basic activities is you know, start reading online about anatomy and physiology and start learning with the movement patterns that they have available to them, what muscles are being worked uh, when they're doing those movements. And then how can they work those muscles given the capacity that they have to impose some degree of resistance? And for a lot of people, that might be isometrics. You're right. It might be holding two cans of beans and doing some kind of like internal or external rotation if you have a bad rotator cuff could be pressing something overhead. Um, if you can move, and if you can move in a way that doesn't hurt, then you can strengthen the muscles that are involved in that movement pattern. And you don't need to overly complicate it. You can build stronger biceps, you know, just by doing some degree of, of lower arm flexion. Now, like you and I know that the biceps also supinate the wrist and function in shoulder flexion, but somebody doesn't need to address all of those specific functions to improve the muscular strength and the joint health as a rational consequence of strengthening that muscle. Um, so any physical activity that somebody can perform that they can build strength at will have a positive carryover in terms of joint health and joint composition and also cardiovascular health. Uh, bodybuilders especially are guilty of being so muscle centric um, but most people I work with are just trying to improve, you know, their daily function. They're just trying to move around better to be more active. Um, I really like what you said about, you know, going upstairs and really holding out of the handrail and maybe putting another hand on the wall if you need to. Um, 
start small, do what you can do. And for some people that might be, if you have a lot of weight, that might be stepping up one stair and just putting a little bit of more weight on one leg and then slowly backing down that one stair and then doing the other leg. Um, you don't need to overcomplicate things. You just need to find a way to safely move in the capacity that you can and to make those movements difficult with some degree of resistance. And um, people that really need it, that's that's the real value of coaching. As somebody like me or Jonathan it could be a, a massive help for people that are struggling just to get through their daily lives. And one anecdote I have from my own studio that I, I keep going back to is I have a 82 year old that came to me probably six plus months ago now on a four point walker, you know, with the tennis balls on the front and you're hunched over and having to walk on that. And she struggled to get in my door because there was a, a little bit of a rise where the door meets the floor. And after a little more than four months of just basic controlled resistance training performed on machines with a, a gradually increasing load over time, she doesn't need her walker anymore. Now, she's not trying to build a 17-inch bicep. She's not trying to compete on a bodybuilding stage, but that's a quality of life improvement that matters to her, and it matters to her family and to the people around her. Um, so it really needs to start from a position of what can somebody do? You know, How can they move in a way that isn't painful for them? And then how can they load the musculature involved in that movement? Um, so I would highly recommend you know, Googling just uh, some anatomy and physiology, listen to videos with physical therapists. Um, personal trainers in a lot of cases might be some of the worst people you could listen to, but uh, physical therapists, uh, orthopedic doctors, um, people that work directly in rehab put out a lot of great content with different movement patterns. Yeah, very well said. Um, perhaps we could talk a little bit about the different tools people could use to actually you know, achieve some kind of resistance or load to the muscles. So obviously you've sure. talked about just walking, holding onto like cans of beans and things like that, putting your body weight on the step. Um, other things we might try is resistance bands. You know, they're a, quite an affordable investment that someone could actually make and without actually having to break the bank. I mean, I've seen lots of people out there with like these little foot pedal things where they go around and, they don't really provide much resistance. It's more about just getting blood flow rather than actually doing the work. I'd actually yeah. argue that in a lot of cases, it's better just to go for a short walk than use those sort of things, especially if there's no resistance. Um, and I'm saying resistance bands just because you can find a way to put that around you, near you, on a stairwell, uh, uh, hook it up to like a beam or something, then find some exercise you can do. Um, for example, if you have a beam or something overhead that you can wrap it around or get someone that you know to wrap it around, you'll do that. Do it that way. Then you might be able to stand up and just pull it down to your, your hip. So that work your black muscles, your arms, your forearms, things like that. Um, yep. If that's not possible, if you can't stand for that long, you sit down in the chair and do exactly the same thing. Um, you can get different resistance bands with different tensile uh, loads as well. So you're not stuck with just one uh, single element to or tool to add to your um, training regime. Yep. Um, outside of that, I'm thinking, you know, if you want to build some strength when you're, you know, holding something, say you want to go shopping one day and you want to call, hold the shopping bags, you'd practice that movement. So you'd grab a shopping bag and hold a shopping bag uh, on each side of your hand sort of thing. Um, another example might be to, let me think now, there's just so many I'm, I'm thinking of right now. Um, like even like a chest press. So you get the band round behind your back, so under your armpits, and you press it inwards and across. Mm -hmm. um, if that's too difficult, you might then wrap it round your hands again on each side and do that that way. Um, you can increase the intensity and the difficulty, the load, the resistance as time goes on. So it's not a case of just doing rep after rep. Um, I mean, Jerome speaks about this very, very, very well, and that is the idea around like time static contractions. So finding a way to load a muscle group uh, and not necessarily load it in a way that's going to cause any damage to your joints and put your body in awkward positions. But there is a way to do it for lots of different muscle groups with just a simple piece of equipment. So perhaps you could outline how that work and what sort of exercise someone might do for a time static contraction. Sure. 
Um, I, I want to just reiterate the idea that exercise bands can be an excellent and very affordable option for a lot of people that may have issues. Unfortunately, the people that have mobility issues oftentimes uh, are so have to spend so much money in their health care just trying to get by that you know they can't always afford a trainer or a physical therapist because insurance, at least over here, can be really finicky with covering certain things. So in terms of affordable options, um, I have a set of resistance bands here in my studio that I think can provide up to something like 140 pounds of resistance if you have all the bands together. And I think it cost me $25 for these exercise bands. Um, I use a yoga belt and a yoga block that together, I think we're under $30. Um, I use a heavy duty toe strap for some movements for isometric work and time static contractions that I got two of them for $30. So there are options out there that under $50, you could get some very basic strength training equipment and um, use it in a way that you're going to be able to improve your strength and therefore your quality of life. Um, so there are options available. So don't get disheartened because it's it's very easy to think about, okay, I need to see a physical therapist, but one, first, how the hell am I going to get there? And then two, how am I going to afford it? Um, there are options. So time static contraction with people that have um, any kind of joint issue or some kind of performance or, or pain issue. The idea is what muscle or what joint am I going to try and strengthen as a result of this exercise? And how can I apply resistance in this uh, movement, <laughs> even though there's not really any movement? Um, because as long as you're as long as you're strengthening a muscle that acts on a joint, there will be a positive carryover towards the improvement of that joint health and composition. So if somebody um, has or they're rehabbing a, a torn rotator cuff, depending on which muscle it is, if it's the supraspinatus that functions mainly in humeral abduction, trying to raise the arm out to the side, um, that's one of the primary movers in like the lower 15 or so degrees of movement. So what you can do is if you have a partner or if you have the side of your bed or you can even go up against a wall, you can push your arm against the wall and push against that wall, even though it's not going to move with gradually increasing levels of intensity. First 30 seconds, you're pushing moderately hard. The next 30 seconds, you're pushing relatively hard. Next 15 seconds, almost as hard as you can. And the last 15 seconds, as hard as you dare. And as long as you are making your muscles contract with a sufficient degree of intensity, they will fatigue. And then the body will overcompensate by strengthening the muscles and all of the associated tissues that innervate that muscle. Um, so it really depends on what the issue that person has is. If it's shoulders, it's probably going to be, you know, some kind of abduction or internal or external rotation of the shoulder, especially for the rotator cuff. Um, I use time static contractions a lot for knees and for hips. Um, and then it, yeah, like I, like I kind of went back to in my first response, one of the best things people can do if they have issues about a certain joint is what muscles and what movements are produced by that joint and by those muscles. And how can I either simulate or perform that movement pattern in a way without pain? And if you can do it in a way without pain, then it's just a matter of applying resistance in that movement with a sufficient degree of intensity. Yeah, I like that. Yeah, I mean, what I notice a lot of people having issues with is leg, hip, uh, back pain, maybe a bit of shoulder pain as well. Um, and obviously, you mentioned kind of earlier, like being able to get out and about to buy all these gadgets and things. It can be tra challenging for some people, but yeah, we can strengthen strengthen the muscles in that area that we're trying to use. Like, I think for a lot of people, just being able to stand up and walk around is so yeah. valuable. Um, a lot of people miss that, you know, some somewhat seemingly obvious aspect of the life. Um, it's sad yeah. to see them lose that in some senses. So what we might suggest for someone that is doing maybe some kind of like time static contraction workout, um, they might do that with a, a deadlift technique. So they might bend their knees, maybe not quite 90 degrees, but maybe halfway between seated and standing. Um, mm. They might have... A rope beneath them which is attached to something in the ground maybe they'll stand on it or something put the put their shoes on it then they'll actually do a time, st timed static contraction in that position 
So they'd have the weight out in front of them, you know, just just believe, uh, between the, the hips, between the legs, basically, and just do a time static retraction in that position. Um, yeah. They might also do that maybe in a more upright position where they're um, almost, you know, completely vertical in terms of their, their body is completely vertical. So they might do a deadlift position like that where their back is in that position or completely upright. So they can do a quad focused and glute focused movement or a mm -hmm. slight uh, lower back focused movement when they're trying to resist with their lower back. So that's two kind of ways I can think is really, really practical for people. Um, yeah. And the shoulders as well. I mean, one thing I'm thinking about is someone, for example, sat on a chair or on a bench, having a resistance band um, un under their legs. So when they're sat down, and holding it on each side and just pressing it halfway up, yep. just holding it, they resist it more, resistance more, you know, so they can actually get that time to tension in and get the, you know, the strength in, the strength element yep. where they're actually resisting it. There's more sufficient load. Uh, so that's two things I can think of that are quite useful. I mean, outside of like that deadlift squat kind of variation and the shoulder press sort of thing, what can you think of that people could do? Um, there's there's a lot of different ways to even like sit in a chair and do a leg extension to where you can rig something up um, depending on the knee. Again, a lot of this, it, it, it's hard because we're trying to paint generalities for people that have a lot of very specific conditions. So um, yeah, shoulder press can be painful sometimes for people due to the external rotation of the shoulder, but uh, a lateral raise is essentially almost every bit as good. Uh, you're just not working the upper traps as much. So if you could do some kind of lateral raise and then maybe like a shrugging movement to, to compensate for that, if that external rotation is uncomfortable for you, um, that's a really good option. But in general, if you can focus more on basic movement patterns, uh, a, a squat type movement, a deadlift type movement, um, some kind of chest pressing movement. Same thing if you have a, a toe strap or um, resistance bands, you can just put it in the backrest of the chair behind you and simulate a chest pressing movement. That's going to hit the chest, the anterior delts, and the triceps on the back of your arms. Um, I, I recommend some grip work for people. Similarly, you could, you know, you could loop a resistance band around something, still sit in a chair and do a, a seated row movements. As think about big compound movements, just a pushing and pulling movement in each direction. So horizontal pushing and pulling, vertical pushing and pulling, and some kind of leg movement if you're capable, and preferably something that articulates the hips, like a torso extension or um, some kind of stomach crunch. Uh, but I know a lot of people with bad hips, backs, um, it can be quite difficult to try and work the muscles of the trunk, uh, even though that's really important. So if you have if you have a partner that can get you into the right position, you can do a torso extension, which is basically wherever you're seated, just trying to lean backwards. Um, you can have somebody rig you or position you in a way to where you're trying to extend backwards, but your back won't move. Um, so I do that sometimes with clients that I have. Um, I do it in my leg extension machine. I have them kind of fold forwards and then I use my toe strap so they can try and pull backwards on their body, but they're not going to go anywhere. And that's for people that have sensitive lower backs that I wouldn't have perform a more conventional hyperextension movement. Um, but if you have, you know, you could also have somebody do that on, somebody could help you with that on your bed. So people that have, you know, especially bad backs, you don't want to put them on the floor. Um, but if they can comfortably, if they can comfortably lay on their back in a bed, you know, you could either get the toe strap around their shoulders or their chest, or you can even hold them gently down by the shoulders and they could try and sit up for abdominal flexion and for their hip flexors. And then if they can comfortably roll over, um, they can do the same thing where they're trying to lift their torso back, provided they have enough space to where they can breathe. Okay. So you got to get a little creative, but I'm a, big believer that if somebody can move, they can exercise. And there's a, a safe way to strengthen the muscles and the joints that function in that particular movement.